In today's episode, Frank and I get nerdy about why Shakespeare matters and the power of protecting your own attention. Now here's today's Talkin' Nerdy. Talkin' Nerdy We're just talkin' nerdy With all this talkin' nerdy Oh, come on, you wanna talk nerdy So what do you think of Shakespeare? Where, where are you on that? Was Shakespeare boring or was it engaging for you? For me, acting was a lot of, I got recognition when I was a kid. I, I got praise for being a good actor, so I continued to do it. And then I ended up actually enjoying it at some point. But as far as like Shakespeare itself, he fell into his work fell into that category of, it was boring when I started, because I started it when I was 11 and 12. And it was hard to understand. But then when I got into high school, I actually started to understand it because we were working on it every year over four years in high school. And so I came to appreciate it. I thought it was fun. I, it was one of those things when someone's like, oh, I understand Shakespeare and what's being said. And you feel like you're in this in crowd all of a sudden and you feel like you're better than a lot of people. <laughs> so that's what Shakespeare was for me. I became this like, oh, I get this sexual innuendo here. That was Shakespeare. Interesting. I hated Shakespeare in high school, and I loved Shakespeare once I got to college. Yeah. And the reason was because in college, That's because it took you longer than me to understand. See, that's because I'm better when it comes to Shakespeare. This is exactly what I'm talking about. I, I actually think <laughs> it, it's because those who... Uh, well, in high school, did you have to get up and act it? Is that the was that something that you guys had to do, or was it mm -hmm. like read to the class type type thing? Because that was English class. Yeah, like we didn't do any acting. We always did contemporary theater in my theater high school class, which is how I got a passion for theater. Was actually just through doing stuff that I could understand and words were easy. And we never did like formal Shakespeare, but in English class we'd read Shakespeare, and there was things I learned about. I, I read a lot of Shakespeare actually throughout grade seven or eight, all the way up to grade 12 when I graduated. But I remember hating it all the way because it was just like, oh, this is stupid, dense, silly. And, and my first impression of Shakespeare was As You Like It, which is still a play I hate. Um, so the thing that I actually, that made the difference for me was when I started to really do acting and started to realize that it's not meant to be read, it's meant to be performed. A lot of times, you know, an actor brings themselves to the text, right? And they elevate the text by bringing themselves to the text. Does that does that make sense when I when I say that? You know, like you you're reading. Go ahead and explain it. Like if I'm reading Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, I'll just say that because I know that play pretty well, and I'm playing Levine, the the lead salesman, right? And the first scene is him and uh, Levine and John, and they're talking to each other, and Levine is trying to sell him on giving him the premium leads the new best leads that just came in and john keeps shutting him down because he's a shitty salesperson so uh and he can smell desperation on him now the words he's using are like please john or john please but the actor has to bring the emotion to those words right the, the actor has to actually elevate it right like the actor elevates the words Shakespeare's the opposite. Shakespeare gives you where the words are. When we hear to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like that Hamlet speech that is, he's telling you in the very first line, it's a let like to be or not to be, that is the question. It's, it's not 10, it is 11 which almost never happens in Shakespearean verse. And the reason why it's that is it's a clue for the actor to know when he says to be or not to be, that is the question. He want, He's really seriously debating killing himself right now. Like that's the level you as the actor have to get to. You have to rise to the words. It's a different thing. That's why when as an actor you do Shakespeare, it pushes you. And that's why so many schools force their people to do Shakespeare, because it pushes you as an actor to rise to the words and the demand of Shakespeare, not the other way around. Whereas a lot of times when you're reading, say, contemporary theater, you know, it'll it'll just say like, you know, 
um, you know, it'll say something like screw you, right. Or fuck you. And you have to like bring the anger to it, or you have to bring the, you know, cause you can say, fuck you any way you want. You can say, fuck you. Or you can be like, fuck you, you know, like you can like a lower tone or what do you have to bring something to it? Whereas Shakespeare, it's, you know, you have to bring your struggle within yourself to that moment of to be or not to be, that is the question. Like it, it, it's a, it, you rise to it or you fail. I think I hear what you're saying in that Shakespeare uniquely takes, that Shakespeare uniquely gives the actor something that already conveys meaning. So it already has the meaning within it. I mean, that's something unique about iambic pictometer. I don't feel like there's a lot of other writers that used it and probably not as well as Shakespeare, but the, a lot of the other stuff is, so if I heard you correctly, elevating it is just by the actor bringing it, bringing their own stuff along with it so that they can elevate it. Yeah. Like you make choices as an actor to do a, a role, especially contemporary role. If you're playing a salesman like Levine, you bring in the desperation and you play that because that's generally what it is. But then you make all these choices about how that desperation shows up. Mm. There's not a lot of gray area when it comes to Shakespeare. And so instead of like you get the idea, for example, like like Shylock at the end of the play in Merchant of Venice is there in the court. And, you know, he doesn't just say like they, they ask him, you know, we expect a gentle answer and they ask him to, you know, let Antonio go um, or, you know, don't demand your pound of flesh. There's this moment in the play. So he doesn't say you know, no, I'm not going to do that because I don't like him. He says a long paragraph. It's like, I have possessed your grace of what I purpose and by our holy Sabbath have I sworn to have the due and forfeit of my bond. Like he comes in, like you have to, like you get a lot more emotion and you have to rise to the emotion of like, how would you actually say it that way as a person? You bring reality to that. Like that's the level of heightened reality that Shakespeare lives at. That's a good point, actually. I really like what you said about you have to bring reality to it. That is one of the things I always appreciate when I see professional theater companies doing Shakespeare is how they bring, they modernize it in a way, you know, whether it, whatever it is, they will, a lot of the plays, as long as they're not historical Shakespeare plays, they will put them in, say, a uh, a boat club. You know, what was the one? It was a Taming of the Shrew. They did one, there was one, um, I saw a clip of it, but it was essentially at a boat club. It was all of these characters, all of the guys were a part of like a cruise liner or, or a Navy crew or something. And I was like, I love it when people do this, when they find really creative ways to turn these into something that's like, oh, that's the kind, that's a kind of environment that I'm familiar with, not boat clubs per se, but whatever is chosen. I do like that bringing reality to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes that stuff's a little cheesy in my mind. I love just classic old style, like traditional Shakespeare, which I understand why people don't do it because they sometimes find it like, oh, you know, Macbeth, it's better to not, you know, let's make Macbeth in World War One, and like, oh, let's make Macbeth in, you know, I'm, nothing's going to beat to me the old classic, like turn, like ancient Scotland swinging swords, like, you know, like that to me is like, it's the best. That's, I, I wonder how that's many awesome. other people feel that way. Cause I would assume it's a niche. You're part of a niche audience of the, you know, college trained actor who's like, oh, I like that old shit that I, that I studied. I like it that way because that is the real proper way that it was meant to be enjoyed back at the time. I, I don't know that I like it because it's just old. I, it's more, I do like a period piece. Not just because it's old, yeah. but because it, it reminds you of a time where it came from. I think it's just very, um, you know, it's authentic. Like, like if you play, right. like what's interesting is if you play something like Macbeth, right? You, there's things about it that are so obvious that make it better when it's authentic. Like just the fact that it is about Scotland, like we all know it's about Scotland, right? But 
do any of you, do we ever see someone play Macbeth with a Scottish accent, right? Like what's interesting <laughs> is if you actually do that, the play works in so many crazy different ways. Like the, the characters of Macduff and the characters of Macbeth, like their lines roll differently when you do them in a Scottish accent. Oh, I like that. That's and, cool. And so there's a power to the authenticity of what Shakespeare was creating. And I get why people don't. They often want to modernize, change, bring it more relevance. And I love that about Shakespeare is you can bring things to more relevance. And I've seen some great productions where people have brought modernization or interesting relevance to a Shakespeare that really is timeless. You know, you know and so I, I like that. But but I'm just saying, like, if I if I look at it, there's so much authenticity that comes out of the text that it's telling you exactly what it's supposed to be. And you have to rise into that as an actor. That's to me, the most interesting and fun thing as an actor to, to do. There's something unique. And one of the reasons I think Shakespeare is one of the goats is that he wrote something at a time that can become relevant, no matter how you change the setting how you change the environment, a lot of the context can be changed and it's still a great story. And I wonder how many other artists out there have done something like that, that could be told through a new lens and still you can glean something out of it and still call it a beautiful work of art with a huge context shift, whether it's environment or the kinds of characters. Because... I know that they've done where you change the gender of the characters in Shakespearean plays and it takes on a whole new meaning. And that's beautiful to me is being able to change a piece of art. You tweak it just a bit here and there, and it's still essentially the same thing that the artist created, but it's different. And and you're right. I think that, well, and the, the other thing I think that, that the reason why that is, is the pure foundational nature of Shakespeare. Like he didn't just write a bunch of stories. He really like invented language to fit the stories that were there, you know, and he took stories that were known and like tragedies of Caesar and all the histories of, you know, the Henry's right. And then you've got Richard's and like all the, the, the different, historical dramas and he took also you know the the relevance of say uh you know uh venice like merchant well merchant of venice yes right. you could, i was going to say that but i was also going to say even Rome, romeo and juliet right like you have romeo and juliet is is a love story a classic love story but it's of you know two 14 year olds like teenage love falling in love very quickly because you can never fall in love over like two or three scenes unless you're 14 you know what i mean like it's just <laughs> the way they fall in love is very much indica- indicative of their age and what the story is and then they don't really understand the dynamics of you know, house politics, and they don't care about that, which is very relevant for probably when he was writing and what that was. People could understand it at a totally different level when you have that that context of like, wow, okay, these these very obvious things that aren't really in the text in the same way they are, but they're they're you have to search for them to really get them. But it's so important to the play. Like Richard the Third, he's got a a he's 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 disabled, right? Like he's bum arm and messed up, and like you know. And I I think that people for like, oh, he's just an evil guy. But it's like, no, it's about his disability. Like, it's about the fact that he's he's different than every other person in the entire country. And he's about to hold the most power. And he overcomes his disabilities through treachery and charisma. And like it's it's a like he plays with these tropes so well he also invented 1700 words. Like there's nobody out there in history who has invented more English words than Shakespeare. He invented words. Yeah. I didn't realize he invented them. I knew that he used a lot of fanciful ones and creative words, but I didn't, I thought that they came before him. Oh no. Like I'll give you a few examples. Um, Examples of commonly were used words that Shakespeare actually uh, created accommodation Aerial, amazement, apostrophe, assassination. These are just the A's. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. um, if we go down to the bottom of the alphabet, obscene, palmy, 
uh, pious, premeditated, radiance, reliance, road, sanctimonious. What? He made these up? Yeah, these are all words. He, laughable. No, 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 no. He can't have made these up. Some of these have roots in Latin and Greek. You know, do some do some cursory research. Shakespeare is known for being the guy who invented the most words in the English language, which is one of the reasons why we still study him. Like, and why you're asking, like, how do how is he so, like he's so relevant because he literally created words and found and put them into contexts where we could create meaning out of them from the stories he told. Mm. Does that like that's why he's so foundational and that's why he's so timeless is because we still pull from his texts today in terms of describing our reality. Right, right. Damn. So he's good. Yeah. He's well, good. No doubt. He's real good. <laughs> it makes me, you know, <laughs> we originally came to record to to talk about time management. And it makes me wonder, you know, how does someone like him come up with all this great stuff? And as I understand it, he had a patron. He had, you know, at one point, even the queen was, you know, funding his art. So he had financial backing so that he could just pursue this every day of the week and then put on productions. And how does... Because I imagine some people probably because I do this, stack themselves up, weigh themselves against the greats like Shakespeare. I'm not saying I'm trying to be in this example, but I'm saying that there are people out there like Joseph Campbell, who I'm like, my God, that guy gleaned some amazing stuff. He's, I think Joseph Campbell is truly a, an observer that saw enough to find a pattern you know, when it comes to, you know, the hero with a thousand faces and the hero's journey, he saw through different societies how stories were told and the similarities and the importance and how that reflects on very Freudian psychoses and psychoses, psychology. Sure, we'll just say psychology. And it was it people like that where I'm like, my God, I wish I had the ability to glean something like that. Or in Shakespeare's case, I wish I had the ability to create something like that, you know? And sure, there's all kinds of stuff. They put in their 10,000 hours. They put in their 100,000 hours, whatever it is. And I would imagine that there are other nerdpreneurs that also stack themselves up and, and put themselves down. Well, it's amazing what you can get accomplished when you don't have a phone. Yeah, right. No phone and you're able to and you have a patron, a wealthy patron to pay for your ability to study and focus if you actually were to be focused. Yeah. And there wasn't any, you know, there's no stranger things to watch every year. Right. You know, you, you right. don't have any of these distractions. Like what else was there to do? Like he basically Try not had to die. Exactly. Like don't get the plague and right. You yeah. Know? Right. Like, <laughs> it, it's, it was, it, it, it is one of those things that I think people don't, um, you know, once you find your, your, when he, when he clearly had the skill, he clearly had the ability and, and things. And there's also rumors that he had a whole team of people writing for him, which also could be possible, you know? Yeah. Um, and that Shakespeare was just like put under the, everything was put under the conglomerate or branding of Shakespeare. Um, it doesn't mean that it was all him. Maybe it was one guy. Um, we love to enhance people to the point of genius so that we can be able to say like, look how amazing this is. And, and that's just, a, that's a very human thing to do. Um, but what I'm saying, what I, I don't think it matters where or necessarily it came from, but I do think that there are circumstances where, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of other opportunities for ent entertainment in the same way, right? We didn't have all these distractions. People were focused. I mean, one of the coolest and most entertaining things he could probably have done with his time was spend time writing and working on this, right? Like he wouldn't have been, you know, worried about other things um, at the time if he had this infrastructure built for him. And so, so yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, what does it, what does it take is to yes, have the talent, the skill and the genius, but then also to be given the freedom to be that genius. Um, so that you, you know, your financial obligations are, are taken care of. And you also have the ability to, uh, 
you know, you owe reason and deadlines and things like that to be able to do it. So there are plays commissioned every four months or every year or whatever. You have a whole team of people in which to workshop things and do it. Like, you know, he had a lot of circumstances, most likely, in which to exercise and rise to the heights that he did. And, you know, good on the Queen for recognizing that he might, that this was the guy to do it. You know, if that was the case, if that's, if it wasn't some team or some, you know, conspiracy of playwrights to make it, if it was one guy, you know, it's amazing that that is what happened and was able to, you know, just focus and make that happen. And I Um, think this conversation actually ties back to something we were talking about the other day, where you want to put in the hours in the beginning, because I'm sure Shakespeare didn't suddenly poof, have this success. Like most people, He worked to get to that point, I would assume. I'm not a historian as far as Shakespeare's story goes. So let's run with the assumption that most people who have accrued success have had to work really hard. They put in a lot of time. I think that there is a challenge now, like you've said, there's phones, but it's how do we how do we carve out that focus? How do we create that focus to maybe not achieve such grandeur of Shakespeare, but how do we carve out that time for focus in our own lives in this world? Because this is the world we're living in after all. I think we have to be patient with ourselves because, you know, even looking at Shakespeare, his first play was uh, The Winter's Tale, which is fine, but it's not what we, like how many have you ever seen the winter's tale did you ever read I the winter's was, tale? i'm racking my brain right exactly now. right like you're like what is that that was his first play that was that we can find he probably maybe wrote other stuff but like it's considered his first ever endeavor as to a public play that was put on all sort of thing right um but it's not the best right like he started there it was good it's beautiful it probably has a few great monologues i don't actually even know that much about it um but as you could progress, he eventually got to the point where he wrote Hamlet, right? right? Where everybody knows Hamlet. Everybody knows to be or not to be. That is the question. Like it's, it's, he gets to the point of brilliance somewhere down the line, right? But where he started is not where he winds up. So we have to, as, you know, people pursuing our own center of genius or our own center of, of, of uh, passion, like a nerdpreneur, be patient with ourselves along the lines of skill building. You know, um, when I yeah. started to pursue music in my thirties, which was a little bit late, <laughs> you know, um, it's something that I had to surrender to the fact I'd never done this before. It's one of those new things for me, and that I'm going to suck at this for a while, and that I have to surrender to this is going to take me ten years to reach any level of. You know, I won't even know if I'll get to the best to the point of mastery, but to the point of, you know, I can feel good about what I'm doing and that this is showcasing skill and, you know, I have some wisdom with it, all those kind of things. But being willing to give yourself the grace of what is the next 10 years? What is the thing you are going to create out of the next 10 years? That's and and take the practice, take the the progressive progress, like the steady progress, acknowledge that that's okay. Um, and not beat yourself up for sucking initially. Like I listen back to the first pieces of music that I created in 2019. How were they? And I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> I'm not, not liking that. But at the time I was like, wow, I'm doing something. And at the time it's like, wow, this is better than nothing. I'm I'm rhyming words. I'm co- kind of on beat, and you know I've got I've got something going together, and, and I can and you know my production sucks and all. But then 2020 a little better, you know uh, 2021 a little better, 2022 a little better, 2023 I'm creating my best music right now that I've ever created. So it's like, does that mean it's you know universally good and there? No, it, but it but you notice and marked progress and giving myself the grace that it's going to take. 10 years, say, to get to that. And I'm not doing it for money, right? Like I'm not pursuing music for anything beyond my soul. I want to actually just have it. I I said to myself, what would I not regret learning as a skill for the next 10 years? And I knew something creative along those lines. If I knew how to create, express my soul or my heart onto a page, into music, I don't think that'll ever become a regret because I could do that for the rest of my life. And 
uh, that was my choice around that. I was like, oh, I'm going to pursue this. And it's become a great joy. Um, but you do mark progress when you work at things like that. And you have to be patient with yourself and willing to suck or willing to just do the hard work of getting over the humps of being the worst in the room or being you know, way worse than your idols. Because if I'm looking at Shakespeare and I'm writing my first play, you're not going to. You know, Shakespeare didn't write his first play and he didn't, you know, he didn't all of a sudden write Hamlet. He wrote Hamlet after having written I probably like 20 other plays, right? That were all steadily different and exposed. Like he'd probably written thousands and thousands of lines of poetry before he got to the point where he could write simply like to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Like there's things that you hear in that that you couldn't have come up with when you started. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. the the rhythms, the, the the intention, the way that it hits you, the 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 meaning behind it, the the simplicity of the line and the complexity is all in there. It's not something that happens in the first rendition. And how easy is it nowadays with our clickbait culture and distraction um, phones and social media to look at ourselves and compare to those who have been working at it for ye for years and years and years or to beat ourselves up because we're not where somebody else is when they go viral or we're not where somebody else is when they you know uh, start a business and all of a sudden make millions of dollars right like that's just it's actually not real everybody who gets somewhere has started somewhere else Hey, Nerdpreneurs, Chris coming at you. Just going to interrupt this episode to remind you that if you want to get all of our extended, full interviews and Talking Nerdy episodes and support the podcast because we don't advertise and this is the only way we can keep going is through our Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash nerdpreneur and become a member of our awesome nerdpreneur board. Board members get a chance to send in corrections, questions, and even suggest future guests. Oh, and also, I screwed up. The first play that Shakespeare did wasn't The Winter's Tale. That was actually his last play, I believe. I messed it up. His first play was Henry VI, Part 1. Now back to the episode. I mean, I could repeat everything you said and totally agree, and it applies, you know, with my own filmmaking work nowadays because i didn't start that until about four years ago behind the camera but now it has come so far and it's to the point where i'm you know pursuing it as a side hustle as well and that's really exciting and that's something that i'm sure we'll talk more about on the show as that progresses but it's still in its infancy now with what were your t you've mentioned several things with regards to distraction and attention and i you know, we've heard attention is that is probably our number one resource where we put our attention. You know, people often say time. Well, time is probably the second or third, some would say, and attention is the first because where we put our attention, like only one thing really gets our attention at a time. So that does beg the question, how do we learn to better focus? How do we learn to divvy up our attention on the things that we really prioritize. For myself recently, you know, we're in January, I did reflect on what are the things I'd like to accomplish this year? Not really goals, not really New Year's resolutions, but what is it this year that I'm excited to work towards? Well, one of them is a vacation. Another one is something to do with our website. There, you know, there's a, a hurdle there that I'd like to get around, but that's going to take several hours. Um, who knows, hopefully no more than a dozen. And there's a lot of, you know, work related stuff that I'd like to do. Well, wh wh I'm curious, because where do you find yourself being distracted? Or what are the time distractions, time sucks, or things that take your attention away from doing these, these priorities? I've actually gotten really good at, at shaving away distractions. I don't use social media hardly ever you know, to the point where I don't really like to do anything on social media, I'd say maybe once every week, I'll binge on Instagram for about 20 minutes. Other than that, I don't, 
I mean, I might spend two minutes a day here or there on Instagram, but I really prefer to stay off of Instagram, for example. YouTube, I'm not on it very often, but when I am, I'm usually doing research for something I'm doing or for other content for us. I'll be doing research or for my day job. So I actually don't have a lot of distractions, but I have a lot of things I like and want to do. So it just comes down to, okay, in the tabletop game world, there's something I want to do. This year, I really want to focus on Star Trek adventures, getting to know the system better, enjoying to tell, enjoying telling a story with some people that I'm currently playing with. And I want to actually commit to that project because I've been one foot in, one foot out this entire time, just of the way that group was. And you were a part of that group. In the beginning, it wasn't what either of us wanted, but it has come to a point where it is very fulfilling. And I, it's been so hard for me to find a crew that I've decided, you know what, these people I play with actually are the crew that I think would be perfect right now. So I'm going to learn with them. We're all going to learn together. We all get along. These are good human beings. So that's an example of something that I'm focusing on. But to address your question of what am I getting distracted by? There's really not a lot. I hardly watch TV. Like I said, I'm hardly on social media. I I, I exercise, I, I take care of myself, I do my work. It's not like there's a lot of opportunity where I'm wasting my time per se. It comes down to actually focusing on what it is I really want to accomplish by identifying those things at some point. Now, video games though. I, you know, video games is, I <laughs> think you. You I'm out. glad you brought this up <laughs> because actually I only play video games a few times a week and it's always to be social. Tuesdays, Sundays, I play for a couple hours with my dad each day on those days. Friday nights, I play a few hours with one of my buddies and his partner. And that is it. Sometimes if I've got extra downtime, I will spend it playing. You know, I called out Deep Rock Galactic. And sometimes I'll, if I have a nothing box that I really, some time I really need for my nothing box. I'm just like totally wiped. I'll, I'll boot up Deep Rock Galactic, I'll have a beer, and I will just shoot some aliens and mine some virtual minerals. It's great. Let me ask you a question on that vein, though. Do you think that you use your time wisely? Okay, here's, here's I guess, what I want to address with that and, and a foundational idea before I get into whether I say yes or no. I think yes, but as a simple answer, but there are things and activities in our lives that give us pleasure, and then there are things in our lives that give us happiness. And happiness, the difference between happiness and pleasure is pleasure, it doesn't continue past the act that you're doing it. So eating is a great example of pleasure. So while I'm eating, I feel pleasure. It's great. But then after I finish eating, depending on what I ate, if I eat a whole pizza, <laughs> <laughs> there's no pleasure after that. You there's know what I'm saying? discomfort. Seeing? Yeah. There's just too much or whatever. Or like, but that's why we continue eating is because we're pursuing, say, pleasure. And by the way, I've eaten a whole pizza before. I've definitely done that. I've also oh, eaten yeah. too, too much pasta or too many uh, sushi rolls or whatever. Like anytime you're eating and the pursuit of that turns that pleasure, that's why we don't stop is because that's what pleasure is. It doesn't continue past the activity you're doing. Whereas happiness, you could also almost interchangeably use it with satisfaction, um, is the, it actually sustains beyond the act. And a great example of this that I ground this in is working out. I rarely want to work out when I start, but when I go to the gym, I go running, I start forcing myself into this activity, my whole mindset and state changes. Even if I just did 20 minutes on a treadmill, for example, at the end of that 20 minutes, my whole state has changed. And now I am happy that I have done it. And that sustains throughout the rest of my day. So it's, it's like there are things now that, for example, last night, it was a Friday, I'm not doing anything. I'm not hanging out. You know, I got asked to go out and drink with some friends and I turned it down because as much as I enjoy hanging with my friends and doing, uh, you know, imbibing drinks once in a while, um, last night I was working on some music and 
I knew for me, I wanted to finish that and get my creative pursuits, create something new, get further along in that. And at the end of the day, I've wound up feeling very, like I felt much happier and more satisfied having made that choice. I also wanted to work on podcasts because I was doing that as well. We have some things going up. I have another podcast I'm working on, like I'm creating different things in the world right now. And I wanted those things to be in the world. And I know that drinking, for example, with my friends can be a distraction. It's not a bad one. Sometimes I need that. Sometimes I want to go spend time with those people. But last night I decided to turn those people down in order to pursue something that I felt was going to be not pleasurable, but build happiness. It sounds like you were in the flow state and you, in the flow state can be elusive at times. So if, if I'm hearing you correctly, you didn't want to miss out on that. You wanted to seize that. Yeah. And, and well, I also feel that there are times I, I've been getting very much in the habit of spending my Friday nights doing those things instead of going out and, you know, pursuing. And that might just be my age. I'm getting a little older now. Um, yes, I don't. Re I've done a lot of partying on Friday nights. I've gone out till two and three in the morning and struggled the next day to get up. Like I've done all that before I've pursued it. And maybe it's just I want something a little different now. And I spend a lot of time, like I, I listen to a book that I've been wanting to get through. I listen to some podcasts that I'm really been excited about listening to. I did play some Baldur's Gate, but it was like probably two hours of it, like between 12 midnight and 2 a.m. waiting for my girlfriend to get off work. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's 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 I didn't feel bad about that because it's pretty much wasted time. Anyways, if I were out, that would be the time when we're just doing shots and drinking and like not really investing our time properly anyways, uh, in many ways. So so I guess that's why for me, the the activities and this isn't perfect. I still engage in pleasurable activities, but I think that there's more of me that is focused on pursuing satisfaction and happiness and actions that provide that than ever before. And when I can make that distinction in my mind around how I want to spend my time, that sustained happiness after the act is more important to me yeah. than it ever was. And creating new things in the world that can leave impact or create impact and leave a little piece of me here in the world is more important than it was maybe five or 10 years ago. Yeah. And our focuses change. I think something you said reminded me that for me, a big focus is increasing my income, increasing my revenue that I, my, my earning potential. That is definitely a focus. Another big focus for me is connecting with people and creating and you know, there's, there's an over, a lot of overlap in those things for you as well, I know. But I think of, you know, you mentioned playing video games. And the first thing that came to mind for me that is, as you said, you know, in air quotes, wasted time, it's, it's actually, you know, it, the alternative is going out with friends for drinks, like you were saying. For me, the one that came to mind was painting minis. Hmm. That's something when I get into, time disappears. And everything, I, I enter this state of painting. It's creative. I might put on a podcast or music. And before I know it, three hours have passed. I'm like, well, I finished one tiny little figurine. That's um, that's impressive. Okay. Uh, that took forever. And for me, that will facilitate connecting with other people because after starting to paint stuff and use them in D&D, &D, I see the reactions that people have at the table. They're so amazed and just so immersed immediately when they can move their characters around a three-dimensional tree on the terrain. They're mm -hmm. like, oh my God, Like I want to go behind here and peek out and throw a knife. I'm like, they wouldn't. They may have said that if it was drawn on the map, but maybe not. And so we get to share in that creative space where we're also connecting. So everything ties into those focuses. Yeah, the imagination gets enhanced by being by using these these things that you've put creative energy into, which is cool, right? Like you've created something that you're using your imagination to almost expand their imagination. Yeah. Especially if you're playing with younger people who maybe haven't 
got the practice or haven't been using it as much. I know you, you play, you play some games with kids sometimes, right? I like, play them with kids, yeah, with but your cousins. also yeah. there's, you know, adults that are new to the game is a great yeah. example. There's a group where they're not used to using their imagination yeah. in that way. Right. So you can ground them into something, but, and these but, are but what... great tools that help facilitate also connection. Like they, they elevate what we're experiencing as a, as a table. And for other, you know, it'll be different examples for other people and what their focuses are. Well, I, I wanted to address one thing you said um, there, and this might be, I don't know, maybe this will be a final point because um, we're getting up close to the end of the time. But I, I wanted to say when you talked about wasting time, you know, um, and you mentioned that there are sometimes things that, you know, you feel like are kind of wasted time. And it's, and I just, I guess want I just want to challenge people to think about time a little differently and the way I look at it is there is no such thing as wasted time. Um, there is only ever invested time. And so there are things that we might do that is invested. Um, and the thing about investment is there is a return on the investment. The difference is when you invest time in certain things, um, the difference comes from the investment that you, or the return on that investment. So for example, if you invest time in say painting that mini so that you can be able to run a better game, the return on that investment is you get a better experience for everybody and a stronger connection from that, which is why for you, that made a lot of sense to spend the time painting and prepping and doing all that stuff so that the return on the investment is you have a better experience, better connection, you're getting what you want and need from that experience and so are they. If we invest our time into, say, watching a TV show like, you know, Top Chef, which is sort of my guilty pleasure <laughs> whenever <laughs> nice. I get a chance, a it's one. my Top Chef is my guilty reality TV show, TV show pleasure that and Gordon Ramsay. I'll watch anything he does. Those are my two <laughs> big ones. Uh, I, I will say that I've probably wasted time on, but I've invested time on. But the return on that investment, OK, the re return on watching a Top Chef is I'm more prepared for the next episode. <laughs> and the reality is that a lot of us are thinking about things in terms of, well, you know, I'm wasting time. There's no such thing as wasted time. There's only invested time. And the return on the investment that you get from that time is what you need to be thinking about in terms of the day to day spending of your of your hours. And so if you're investing time into social media, there's very, in my mind, very little return on that investment most of the time from scrolling, for example, right? Um, you know, there is some. Like you if know you a little are bit. trying to make content as well. There's some yeah. research component to that. Yeah, there's research like that if you're making it, being aware of what's going on in a market or niche, right? Um, being invested into uh, a, a culture like D&D &D or nerdpreneurdom. There are some things that I think we do, but does that spill over into wasted time or invested time that doesn't really create a return on investment? Yeah. Yeah, I actually, so two examples, as an actor, I used to always tell myself, I, so I never really have been big on TV shows or movies throughout my entire life. It's never been a big draw of my time. But once I recognized as an actor that that was considered research, I started watching a lot more stuff and I felt research, so yeah. much better about doing it thinking, oh, I'm studying, you know? And so I actually pulled up like the list of all the Oscar winners for the last 50 years and I went through them one at a time. And I didn't finish the list. It's a lot of movies, but it was that idea of, oh, I'm studying. And everyone always kind of thought that was silly of me. But it, it, in reality, that is what actors do. They should be studying like that in many other ways. The other thing is Star Trek. For me, Star Trek was my guilty pleasure. The investment of it, though, was within the last couple of years, making me more knowledgeable for the Star Trek Adventures role playing game. Because the people I play with, many of them know so much more than I do in whether it's certain parts of Star Trek or their personal real life fields of study. We have the doctor in our group. She's actually in med school. And the uh, engineer is actually an IT guy who also works on hardware. So I say something and they're like, what kind of mineral is it? And I say, uh -huh. oh, it's a rare earth uh, metal. And they go like, which one? And I say, ah, fuck. Okay. <laughs> so I have to Google it really quickly and I pick a random one. And in this recent scenario is I said, cerium. And she says, 
Interesting. And she immediately starts making notes. And I'm thinking, fuck, now I have to figure out how this is actually going to play into the situation now. (laughs) But I love that because it elevates me. You know, they're challenging me and pulling pulling me to to learn and to expand. And so I had to figure out what the fuck Sirium actually does. And then I'm like, okay, how is that going to react with the whole machinery that they've recently encountered? Yeah, this is a cool thing between the connection of improv and science. Yes. Like, it's like improv has certain rules and structures and like, but it's not real, right? Most of the time, like you can make anything up you want, but they're grounding your improv in like scientific physics yes. facts, right? Yes. They're like, well, Sirium can only do this, this, and this, and it doesn't react well with this. So but, um, and there, none of this makes sense. Like, fortunately, sense. there is forgiveness because in Star Trek, there's, you know, uh, trilithium or tri. Uh, I think it's trilithium. It is so inconsistent throughout the series because dilithium is always the same thing. It's always fuel used to power ships. So it's consistent. But trilithium has been, at least in the next generation TV show, it's said to be three different things. You know, one time it's described as a waste product. Another time it's described as this highly volatile, you know, illegal substance. And and so you get things like that where it's okay, I can give myself some grace room on this in this <laughs> group of, you know, improv tabletop gaming. Ah, yeah, but the investment in Star Trek has found its way over the years to circle back into use. Well, all time is invested. There is no wasted time. I really like I think that. that might be yeah, there might this might be the best place to to finish off today's talking nerdy. So what do you think, Frank? Yeah, there is no wasted time, only invested time. I love that. Awesome. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. If you're listening with us, we respect you, we love you, and as always, keep it nerdy.